The sheer beauty and sophistication of Egyptian artifacts entrances us. How can we unlock the code embedded in every object they made? How does the symbolism in Egyptian art illuminate their cultural values? What ancient secrets still lie hidden in plain sight? Our understanding of ancient Egyptian culture is limited. Looking at the artifacts left behind by the ancients, it is obvious that they had different values, customs, and beliefs from ours today. History books are filled with stories of war, invasion of territories, and patriarchal ways of being and thinking. Yet, it seems that ancient Egypt enjoyed long periods of peace and prosperity, and a profound connection with nature and spirit. Is there a way to understand the shift? So what we refer to as history that began some 6,000 years ago is really the advent of a, a different style of social organization that's typified by hierarchies of dominance, you know, warring deities, warring mythologies, and control systems. Vedic culture from ancient India speaks of a grand and measurable cycle of 26,000 years, consisting of ascending light ages and descending dark ages. In the higher ages, you see this philosophy of living in tune with nature, People talk about speaking with the gods and a lot of interaction. Virtually every ancient culture has stories about the gods if you go back far enough. And you see a lot of uh, matriarchal cultures if, if you go back far enough. You know, the Dark Age times, you have this very brutal, uh, paternalistic type of uh, ruling. I think it's difficult for us to understand the ancient Egyptians because we've got the paradigm of the patriarchal structures on top of it, and we're looking through our own cultural lenses. Has world culture always been male-dominated and patriarchal? If not, what would a matriarchal system look like? Matriarchy is not the opposite of patriarchy with women dominating and controlling men. It is based on balance between the masculine and feminine, and harmony with nature. This was exemplified in ancient Egypt, which was known in the old language as the land of Kent. Hakim Awian received teachings about the Kemetian people in the distant past. The ancient life system in Egypt here. The commission tradition being passed down through the mother. Mother is the teacher, not the father like patriarchy system. This is matriarchy. She is the goddess. She is everything in the house. Based on the countless artifacts that show the high status of the feminine, it seems that women had the same status as men, if not a higher status. In the museum, uh, you have uh, statues. Uh, you notice that the woman put the arm around the man's shoulder. And uh, that shows, are they equal? 
No woman was the upper head in the family. When she put her arm around the man's shoulder, she's saying, this is mine. You also see that uh, the sculpture in, in the old days put the feminine wig on a man's head when he promoted uh, more to a woman than a man. Men's wigs were layered in different lengths, like steps. Women's wigs were parted in the middle, smooth, and all one length. When a man wore a woman's wig, it was an indication that he had high status. Only men with wisdom who wear the women wig. So these are the scribes and the physicians and the rest of them. All you can do is go back into the old kingdom and what you find is, you know, is obviously a fair amount of equality. The goddesses are revered as reverently as the gods. And there's even the instance, for example, of, of, of Hathor, the, the exception in that she's the only deity that has a temple column all to herself. So the great mother, the great feminine principle, occupies a very important part in, in the whole Egyptian symbology, the whole Egyptian doctrine. There's, no, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Women could own property at, at as much rights as the men. They could divorce as easily as the men. Of all the known sophisticated civilizations that we have access to, probably women were better off in Egypt than they were anywhere else. Perhaps we are looking at ancient Egypt from a patriarchal viewpoint. We should let the symbolism in the artifacts tell their own story. The frescoes we see lining temple walls in Egypt and on stone slabs in museums around the world each tell their own story. We see the same images repeated again and again in Egyptian art. By learning to decode these symbols, we can look back in time, peeling back the layers of patriarchy that cloud our understanding of ancient history. Then we can begin to decipher the messages that the ancients left us. You have to accept that we're dealing with a period that occurred at least 5,000 years ago. And the little we know of it comes from archaic texts that were written in a very occult and esoteric manner. They weren't meant for you and me. The secrets of the ancient Egyptians were not for the commoners. They were meant for a very, very small group of elites who had to be initiated over many, many years to appreciate what this text said. They were for the high-level initiates, which were people who were trained, and they would go through different initiations, tests, that would help them be wise, that would help them confront their fears, that would balance them, balance them in the body, mind, and emotions. Initiates were students who were given rudimentary instruction on the mystery traditions of Mayan and Egyptian cosmic cycles. As they approached higher levels of consciousness, they came to respect different aspects of themselves that were represented in the feminine and the masculine. But they went further and called it sacred feminine and sacred masculine, which meant the purest form that was actually connected to the two hemispheres of the brain. Feminine consciousness corresponds to the right hemisphere of the brain and the left side of the body. In contrast, masculine consciousness corresponds to the left side of the brain and the right side of the body. Patriarchal consciousness focuses on history, linear time, dogma, rationality, waking reality, and science. Matriarchal consciousness focuses on eternity, cycles of time, ritual, magic, altered states, and art. If we examine the art, we can see the characters almost always have one foot slightly forward. In some instances, they take a big step forward. In each scene, the goddess has her left foot slightly leading, showing awareness of the feminine principles of 
timelessness and magic. The pharaoh, however, takes a large step with his right foot. This shows that he is grounded in the masculine. Similarly, we often see images with two left hands. It has been suggested that this is just a stylistic convention, but we should not impose our ideas on Egyptian art. Left hands suggest giving, while right hands suggest taking. In our culture, we've practically erased the feminine in favor of the masculine, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Art, music isn't as important, and our society is completely unbalanced because of it. The ancients knew that you could not achieve high states of consciousness without these being in balance, and so they revered the pure qualities of either. And so when we say sacred feminine and sacred masculine, this was the highest form of respect so that the female would have both feminine and masculine balanced within her, and the male would have both feminine and masculine balanced within him. Balance between the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine runs deep in Egyptian symbolism. We see gods and goddesses carrying a crook, a flail, and a staff in various combinations. The crook represents the balance of the emotions. The flail symbolizes the balance of the mind, and the staff depicts the balance of the body. Once balance of the body, the mind, and the emotions was achieved, consciousness could develop. Notice the staff always has the head of a bird and a forked base. The staff never touches the ground. This indicates that we are spiritual beings having an earth experience. We are incarnated here, but our souls can go beyond the earthly plane. Egyptian temples were places where spiritual work was done. An arch with a winged disc is always found at the entrance to temples. The winged disc depicts a vulture and a snake. The snake been taken as a symbol of masculine and uh, the vulture is the feminine. The feminine and the masculine had to be in balance. The lower self was to surrender to the higher self in order to enter the sacred space. This meant that the ego of the everyday world had to step aside, while the higher self connected with cosmic energy. A vulture can fly, a snake can't fly, but both have the same glands. System of life is based on glands. The glands were the most important features of the human being. One of the most misunderstood functions of the human body today is our glandular or endocrine system. Glands secrete hormones that trigger reproduction. Fertility and procreation had high value in Egyptian ideology. The ancients were very much in tune with how the energy systems in the body, or the chakras, as the East Indians would talk about them, were connected to the glands. Ancient teachings speak of seven energy centers in the body called chakras. Parallels occur between the concepts of chakras, or energy centers in the body, and our glands. It appears they are two ways of describing the same thing, through spirituality and through science. Ancient Egyptians had a holistic understanding of the significance of the glands and their central role in reproduction and in consciousness. If we can decode the symbols, we see that the sacredness of procreation is readily visible in ancient Egyptian art. When you see a boy or a man, you see a kind of a, a bottle on his head. That is uh, not a bottle or not a, a white crown symbolizing Upper Egypt, as my colleagues and, and, and the scholars say. No, 
This is a gland in the human body known as the thymus, located behind the lungs. The thymus is most active when a baby is in utero. It continues to be active until puberty. Then it begins to shrink and is atrophied when we stop being fertile. It was a critical activator of consciousness. The red crown is another. It's the womb, the placenta, the thymus and the womb are connected for the cycle of life. When you see the double crown, the red crown is the womb and the placenta. The white crown is the thymus who has its influence on the womb. That's the symbol of one of the glands. In the early 1900s, alchemist Schwoller de Lubitz presented a work called The Temple of Man. It demonstrated that the architects of the Luxor Temple used sacred geometry, which reflected the exact proportions of the human body. As in all Egyptian temples, the most sacred space was located at the back of the temple, the Holy of Holies, which corresponded to the pineal gland. When activated, the pineal gland is said to stimulate the evolution of higher states of consciousness. If the temples were metaphors of the human body, the pineal gland corresponded with the Holy of Holies. At the entrance to the most sacred part of the temple stand tall pillars representing the masculine and the feminine, papyrus and the blue lotus. The papyrus and the lotus reflect the balance between the feminine and the masculine principles and are shown together throughout ancient Egyptian art. The blue lotus is a symbol of life and this plant, blossom, flower, it grows in the water like water lilies. It's where the ancient commissions believe that life starts in water and in that lotus form. We have seen there are always multiple layers of meaning embedded in ancient Egyptian symbols. Is there another reason why the blue lotus was so important in Egyptian ceremonies? In ancient Egyptian art, we see countless instances of part animal, part human forms. What were the ancients trying to convey by these curious images? There's a technical term for, for such creatures that anthropologists use. They call them therianthropes, and that's from the Greek therion, which means wild beast, and anthropos, which means man. They're combinations of beast and man. It's not an accident that all of the gods of Egypt are therianthropic. They have, of course, fully human forms, uh, but m in most cases they also have forms that are part animal and part human. So you may consider Horus, the head of a hawk and the body of a man. Uh, you may consider Sekhmet, uh, a lioness with a human body and a lion's head. Or Anubis, of course, the guide of souls, who is part jackal and part human. Egypt isn't the only place where these half-animal, half-human images have been found. Half a world away, we find clues to decode these mysterious symbols. Throughout the Amazon today, uh, shamans working with uh, the powerful visionary Bru ayahuasca, a combination of two, of two plants, uh, very frequently they will, after their visions, when they return to uh, the normal alert, problem-solving state of consciousness, they will actually sit down and, recollecting what they saw in the visionary state, will paint and draw. Uh, the images that, that, that they saw. And, and the most common motif of these uh, ayahuasca visions is the therianthrope, creatures that are part animal and part, part human in form. This specific characteristic of the ancient Egyptian gods is one of the things that tells me that our um, ancient Egyptian ancestors were using altered states of consciousness to explore the realms of spirit. Again, we see images of blue lotuses. 
Is there another, less obvious interpretation of this symbol? Altering of consciousness has been done by a variety of different methods and techniques. Most commonly in shamanistic cultures, still to this day, it's done by using hallucinogenic plants, which, as it were, switch the receiver wavelength of the brain and allow us to tune in to, to other realities. Of course, there are a range of uh, non-drug techniques, uh, rhythmic dancing, certain kinds, of, certain kinds of music, certain kinds of spaces uh, have an effect on human consciousness. But there's a great deal of evidence that they made use of, uh, of a potion involving the blue lotus and the mandrake root, possibly also the opium poppy as well, to enter a visionary state, uh, and, and in that visionary state to explore, navigate, and learn about the realm that lies beyond death. And they had very concrete and specific ideas about this, which are expressed in the ancient Egyptian books of the dead, going right back to the, to the pyramid texts. This was not a work of imagination on the part of the priests. Uh, this was a work of documentation, uh, of their out-of-body exploration uh, of realms that lie beyond the, 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 the merely physical. Is it possible for us to learn to access other realms today? Can we expand our capacity to perceive? Do we need new ways to describe these phenomena? If I come to that and say, I saw you in my dream, you're going to ask me, what did you see? Then I say the dream. Now, did I show you? The verb see is not there because I did see you in my dream, but not with my eyes because I was asleep. So how, how did that happen? It must be a sense put all this vision to me without my eyes. But I still, when I speak, limit vocabularies to say, I saw you in my dream. No, I didn't see you. But uh, there's no other way to say it. Could the ancients have mastered innate human abilities that we have forgotten? You can't tell if that bird on the tree is happy or frightening from a cat. Yeah? You can't tell that the donkey is annoyed or happy by the vibration of the sound. And that's what we want us to notice, the sound. What? It's not the word you said, it's how being said. You can tell if this vibration, uh, the truth or not truth. It's natural. It's healthy people, they use all the senses, the full capacity of senses. The five senses, as we know them today, were symbolized by the scarab. And when you see the scarab, you are looking at a human skull. Uh, the divine three sides, three sections. The front head, symbolized by ancient people as seven. Seven openers. Two, four, six, seven. That is the front head. And these are the receivers. You see with, you hear with, you taste with, you know, everything. On the left side is the consciousness side, and that is uh, the daily deeds digested every uh, moment you look at things. But the other side is the subconsciousness side, something you are unable to explain what's going on. It seems clear that the ancients knew about the subconscious mind. They had the power to reach beyond the senses, something we began to be aware of with the writings of Freud and the advent of psychology in the early 1900s. Don't compare people of today uh, like the people of the ancient days. The people of ancient days were healthy. They able to use the senses. We looking at things as a crippled people. We only have five senses. We supposed to have 360 senses. 360 and only five is recognized. We got the glance of the sense, but we didn't use it. 
And any muscle you don't use, it shrink. Obviously. How can we begin to imagine that the ancients had the capacity of 360 senses? Perhaps a metaphor for the full spectrum senses could be a sphere. Is it possible for us to move beyond our five senses today? Our five familiar senses have been evolved by evolution uh, to connect us to the physical and material realm. Uh, but uh, we have, I like to think of it as a, as a secret doorway uh, inside our own minds, which can be opened in altered states of consciousness, through which we may project our consciousness into other realms and dimensions, and those then become accessible to us. Could it be that the ancient Egyptians were accessing supernatural realms through heightened perceptions that came from full-spectrum senses? I come to the conclusion that it's really impossible to understand uh, ancient Egyptian civilization and ancient Egyptian spirituality and religion until you get to grips with the fact that the priests uh, of that religion were deliberately and in a targeted way cultivating altered states of consciousness in order to access the supernatural realm. They know what shamans all over the world still know today, that in the alert uh, problem-solving state of consciousness that is particularly valued by Western industrial society, uh, you are not going to have uh, supernatural or spiritual experiences uh, of, of any kind. Uh, it doesn't mean that the supernatural and spirit realms are not there, because they are. They are all around us all the time. Uh, but our senses cannot tune into that. It seems that the ancients must have been tuned into something that allowed them to build sacred structures using monumental architecture. Today, we consider ourselves to be highly educated, yet engineers are at a loss when they try to build even a small pyramid. Has our system of education diverted us from what was common knowledge in ancient times? There were no schools and uh, universities like what we have today. We've been influenced by this uh, system of teaching. Today, we think it's a relative life that no education, they haven't been to school, and how can they build a pyramid? They don't know figures, how can they do this? But we don't know that the senses we have make the impossible possible. The impossible to us, which is based on ignorance, make it possible. Because knowing is a very great power, just to know. The most important ceremony for teaching the populace how to live well was the weighing of the heart. It reveals what the ancients believed happened in the moments after death. Initially, in the ceremony of the weighing of the hearts, the deceased would meet Anubis, who would say, you're dead. Let's have your heart. We're gonna weigh it against the feather of truth. If your heart was heavy, because you had done something immoral, you weren't allowed to go to the other side. So the populace learned that they had to be light of heart in order to live well. As ancient Egypt slipped into patriarchal ways of being and thinking, the old spiritual ideology became codified and organized religion became dominated by the Amun priesthood. The Amun priesthood had a lot of power, and they were in a position to have people pay for their salvation. It used to be that your heart was weighed against a feather of truth, but in later pictures of the ceremony of the weighing of the heart, you'll see Horus holding onto the scale, and you could pay the priesthood for Shakti dolls, and the more of them you had, 
the more likelihood you could buy the lightness of heart instead of being light of heart. Well, this is a fundamental change in terms of how to live well. And I think that we still are living in that way. History is written by its victors. And as the patriarchy took hold, much effort was put into suppressing Egypt's matriarchal past. There's a few pharaohs who were erased from the king's list. Hatshepsut was one, Akhenaten was one, and Tutankhamun was another. The legacy of the controversial pharaoh, Akhenaten, was almost lost forever with the complete destruction of the city he and Nefertiti had founded at Amarna. Now, very little was known about Amarna until there was an earthquake and the pylons at Karnak were filled with these little blocks that had been cut up and they used them from Amarna to just put to, as filler inside the pylons. So when archaeologists found them and started putting them back together, they realized there was a very large story here. For the ancients, life on Earth mirrored the motion of the stars in the sky. What the ancients did is they would have the capital be at Heliopolis in the north for 2,160 years, and then they would have the capital be at Thebes, which is now Karnak, for that length of time. When Akhenaten came into power in the new kingdom of the 18th dynasty, it was right at the time when things were supposed to shift. During this time, the patriarchy gained momentum, with the Amun priesthood steadily becoming more powerful. Akhenaten happened to have been born at one of these points of the return or beginning. He believed that he was subjugated, like all pharaohs, to a cosmic law, to the law of Vat. What happens up there, they believed was controlling matters on Earth. And things happened up there that dictated to Akhenaten that he had to move his base and had to reinstall the original religion. When it came time for Nefertiti and Akhenaten to change the capital, they knew that the Amun priesthood was in power and that they would really fight them on this. If he had moved to Heliopolis, there would have been civil war. If he had stayed in Karnak, he would have not performed what he had to perform to follow the law, the cosmic law. Finally, he settles for a midpoint. So instead of moving the capital back north, they decided to take a point exactly in the middle between the two, and this was Amarna. Art created by artisans in the Amarna period is exquisite and markedly different from the art in other periods. For the first time, Egyptian royal art depicted the pharaoh and his family all together and clearly showing affection for each other. They built this wonderful place and they had gorgeous palaces, and people were creative. It was peaceful, there were flowers and nature, and people lived a leisurely life. But what it was, was a return to true spirituality. He ruled with his co-regent, Nefertiti. The feminine was honored. In this transition, Akhenaten and Nefertiti rejected the established religion of the corrupt Amun priesthood. They had a profound respect for solar energy, known as the Aten. And so returning to this was a big threat to the Amun priesthood. And so they plotted to take Amarna down. They eventually brought him down, and they destroyed his city, and they reinstalled the ancient gods, and with all their iconography. Yeah, they simply destroyed everything, every trace of them. Um, if they didn't find the ruins of Akhenaten's temples, um, used as fill, rubble fill in the walls of Karnak, there'd be almost no sign of, of, of Akhenaten. Amarna was a peaceful society with great creativity and beauty. 
Yet scholars in traditional Egyptology continue to portray Pharaoh Akhenaten as a deformed, renegade, heretical leader. But see him as a heretical king, it's quite the opposite. The heretics were the priests. He was not heretical, he in fact was somebody who was determined to adhere to the divine law. And he went to the cross for it. After the fall of Akhenaten, Tutankhaten, a boy of only nine years old, became pharaoh. Now, because we found Tutankhamun's tomb intact, we know a lot about him and the life that he lived. Now, he was raised at Amarna. Now, some people say that Akhenaten was his father. We don't have DNA tests. We haven't found the mummy of Akhenaten. We don't know that for sure. But it's interesting that he started out as Tut Ankh Aten, because at Amarna they worshipped the Aten. But after he took the throne, they opened the temples again, they moved away from Amarna. It seems that as soon as the Amun priesthood found out that he actually was of the Aten, he changed his name to Tut Ankh Amun, that suddenly he disappeared. After 10 years of leadership, when Tutankhamun was 19, he died mysteriously. His mummy was x-rayed, revealing a fractured skull, suggesting a blow to the back of the head. It seems that he was buried in a rush. His tomb is very small. And close to it, there were a whole lot of mummies that were moved in a cache and put aside. So it's almost like there were several mummies from other dynasties that were in the tomb that he ended up in and then they took furniture from Amarna and buried him there. Though the tomb of King Tut left us many clues, his fate remains a mystery. Another casualty of the patriarchal retelling of history is the story of Queen Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut came earlier in the 18th dynasty. She started out by being a queen, and then she became pharaoh. Hatshepsut was a wise and powerful leader who re-established trade networks with Egypt's neighbors, building the prosperity of the 18th dynasty. He was certainly ruling for a long time at a period of tremendous peace and prosperity. The artwork was never better than under her reign. Had she been male, she would likely have been remembered in history books as the best ruler of Egypt. Regardless of her success as a leader, she is still an enigma. There has been much controversy about Hatshepsut. It could be due to the patriarchy having little tolerance of images of an empowered woman. No one seems to agree on who the real Hatshepsut was. There have been you know, massive books written on, on Hatshepsut, and again, there are, no, there are no real conclusions. Obviously, Hatshepsut must have been a very able ruler because she stayed there apparently 22 years. But somehow, about 20 years after she passed, uh, her statues were broken and all put into a pit. When they found them, they started putting them back together. But like Akhenaten and Nefertiti, the Amarna period, they were largely forgotten because the people who came after were very threatened, and they somehow wanted to destroy all trace. Hatshepsut, Nefertiti and Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, they were the ones that really understood spirituality in some way. I suppose there was no money to be made if you weren't selling salvation. We may never know how the high courts of ancient Egypt were run. It seems likely that the stories passed down through the patriarchal institutions of the 19th and 20th centuries may have misled us. The peace and prosperity of the 18th dynasty, particularly in the time of Hatshepsut, Nefertiti and Akhenaten, had to do with honoring the feminine in balance with the masculine. Looking at Egyptian artifacts and frescoes, it is clear that the feminine principle played a prominent role in society and was cherished and revered.
The feminine principle was articulated in the concept of a great mother who was central to the ancient Egyptian worldview and was echoed by other world cultures. The Milky Way in the sky is mythologized in various ways in various traditions and various cultures around the world and it's, it's often thought of, almost universally thought of, as a, a great mother principle, the great cosmic mother in the sky. In ancient Egypt, biology met cosmology and both were considered sacred. When you look at the cosmology in terms of biology is describing events that happen inside of a womb. And the womb happens to be the womb of the mother goddess. In both Mayan and ancient Egyptian cosmology, the center of the Milky Way galaxy is where stars are born. Metaphorically, it is the womb of the great cosmic mother, represented as Isis, giving birth. We keep looking at how the ancient Egyptians thought, and everything fed biology and procreation. How we got here, how we came into existence, biology, and then how we left, and how our soul continues to live. And we can see that there aren't really that many symbols that aren't pertaining to balance of the body, mind, and emotions, and to balance between the two hemispheres of the brain. Once we can embrace that, then it's easier to understand the Egyptians. That uh, switch from matriarchy to patriarchy, I think it's the cause of what's on the world now of conflicts and, and disagreement and, and showing off power. Yeah. Already, the beginning of the first dynasty of ancient Egypt, Egypt was moving from being matriarchal to coming into more patriarchal ways of being and thinking. There were a few periods where the ancient, ancient knowledge was remembered. But it's important to remember that there was a lot of ancient Egypt prior to the dynasties and in the early periods that did not represent those values. So the parts of Egypt that I find the most interesting come from the memory of times that came further back. I said many times that healthy people, they got the power which is Unhealthy people haven't got it. And I want you and all my friends and all my beloved to know that you have it. And when you know that, you will work on it to come bring it stronger. As I said before, uh, the senses just like muscles. If you don't use, it shrink and go.